First off, they would like you to repeat what you said when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was struggling the phrase, please. Say it again. Please repeat the phrase about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when he was struggling with his mother's death. Which phrase? The, the phrase you were citing when you were talking about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his mother passed away. The Jaat. Oh, okay, okay. Okay, that, that statement, sorry. The, the, the statement is uh, a prophetic statement that when a person faces calamity, they say, Inna lillahi ma akhath. Inna lillahi. Can you pull this podium back a little? Is it possible? Or is it in? I can try. I just can't see the front few lines and I've saw them through the whole lecture and I feel like it's kind of... There we go. Is that okay? Can we see you guys? Yes? That's better. Okay. Inna lillahi ma akhath. Everyone say it. Inna lillahi ma akhath. Walahu ma a'ta. Wa kullu shay'in indahu bi ajalin musamma. Then fasbir, which means be patient. Wal tahtasib. I know it's a long word, but say it. Wal tahtasib. And then wa inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raji'un. That's the statement. No. I mean. Moving forward, is the only way to get this connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be a, is to be a minimalist? How do we practice this in today's world? Minimalism. It could be a solution. Look guys, actions themselves rarely carry solutions unless there's purpose attached to them. Do you guys understand that? Yoga won't give you spirituality. Meditation won't give you spirituality. For crying out loud, salah even won't give you spirituality. Do you guys understand that? It has to have what? What did I say? Purpose. وَمَا أُمِرُوا إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُ اللَّهَ مُخْلِصِينَ لَهُ الدِّينَ حُنَفَاء That's when salah will give you purpose. أَقِيمِ الصَّلَاةَ لِذِكْرِ That's when salah gives you purpose. So the same thing with minimalism. Minimalism could work if the purpose is right. Which some scholars may refer to as zuhd. Right? They may refer to a life of minimalism as zuhd. While others may counter and say that zuhd necessarily isn't minimalism, and this is why this is important, because if someone sitting here chooses to live life the way they're living it and not cut back on their luxuries in life and be a minimalist, if they want to continue, can they find spirituality? Absolutely. Don't we have an example of Uthman bin Affan radiallahu an? Yes or no? Do we have an example of Abdurrahman bin Auf radiallahu an? Absolutely, these were people who Allah had blessed and they lived. See, this issue of uh, connecting with Allah has less to do with sorry, how much you possess and has a lot more to do with the way you interact with what you possess. Do you, do you guys understand? Like, There could be a person that's very wealthy and every time they bring a dollar home, they thank Allah ten times for that single dollar because they realize Allah is the one who gave it to them. So that dollar connects them with Allah. You know that idea I was talking about how every materialistic thing you possess, how does it connect it to your reality? So that wealth can connect them to Allah. I have friends who sit in the car and every time they sit in the car, they just keep saying Alhamdulillah ten times again and again because they're so thankful for Allah giving them a car. So I don't, I'm not sure if the answer is minimalism in and in it of itself. It could be. It all boils down to the purpose and perspective that you live with, and that'll bring you close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wallahu alam as If community is what we need to grow in our deen, how do we build our own communities without feeling like a hypocrite? Say that first part again. If community is what we need to grow in our deen, how do we build our own communities without feeling like a hypocrite? I don't know if I understand that. So basically, if you are trying to create a community and you are yourself are not super strong in your deen, how do you create that without feeling like you're being a hypocrite? Okay, let me try to, let me try to answer it. I'm not sure if I fully get it even now. I apologize my lack of understanding. But I'll try to explain it to the best of my ability from what I understood. Sometimes you may feel like you have nothing to offer. That's what you might feel like. You know, someone sitting here may think that, what am I going to offer to Islam when we have a great sister like this at the front? You know? And that's very, it's a common feeling by the way. It's a common feeling because you look at other people who are doing more and you think of yourself as being inferior and you think to yourself that if I do anything, people are going to look at me as a hypocrite because I'm not someone that really carries myself 100% Muslim. You know? So remember this. 
Okay? This again is shaitan just praying away at you. He's just making fun of you and making a mockery of you and taking you away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You have rights over this religion just the way I do. In Islam, the ownership of religion is not distributed based off of how long your beard is. Mine wraps around my waist five times, so I have more percentage than you do. That's not how it works. Every person who says, La ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah has equal ownership in this religion. Do you guys understand that? Everyone has equal access to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, equal access to the deen. Now, if a person it wants to contribute towards building a community, but they're actually hypocrites. Hypocrisy isn't just uh, saying something and believing something else, even though that is a very strong element of hypocrisy. But hypocrisy is, you know, there's a discussion, right? That can I tell someone to wear the hijab if I don't wear it myself? Can I tell someone else to pray the hajjud if I'm not praying it myself? Yes or no, guys? Yeah, thank you. Who said that? I love it. Whenever someone asks you a question, the best answer is, it depends. Do you guys understand? Beyond the joke of it, it also shows that you appreciate nuance. Yes and no generally represents that your worldview of religion is black and white. And when it comes to this issue, it's definitely not black and white. There's a sister who may not be wearing hijab and can advocate on behalf of hijab. There's this person that may not pray tahajjud, but they can still give a lecture on tahajjud. As long as they desire to do the act themselves. If in my mind I think hijab is for suckers and losers, and I tell other people to wear hijab, that's hypocrisy. Do you guys understand that? If I don't desire to do the act and I tell other people to do it, that's hypocrisy. That's not okay. The Quran prohibits that. لِمَا تَقُولُونَ مَا لَا تَفَعَلُونَ كَبُرَ مَقْتًا عِنْدَ اللَّهِ أَنْ تَقُولُوا مَا لَا تَفَعَلُونَ That's prohibited in the Quran. But as for saying what you don't do while desiring to do it yourself, but you're not doing it because of your inability, your weakness, that's okay. That's a part of life and that's something that you have to get through. So don't step back because let me tell you this, whoever asked this question, if everyone who thinks like you, and by the way, I'm, I'm one of you too, by the way, that's me as well. If everyone who thinks like us that I'm not worthy of it, I'm not going to do anything because if I try to build, be a part of the community while I'm a hypocrite, what good will I bring to society? We can never have a community. We are a community because of our strong and broken components. Do you guys understand? We don't want a perfect community. I don't want a perfect family. Inshallah, in Jannah. Perfection is for? It's for Allah, it's for the Akhirah, not in this dunya. It's not for the dunya. We want everyone to come with your broken parts, with your version of whoever you are today, and let's work together on becoming a better community. Wallahu alam. I think I have a session right now. Right? No, it's not yet. We only took 35 minutes. Oh, it's at 3.30. I thought it was at 2.30. Go ahead. Next question. When faced with tragedies in life, how do you keep hope alive that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not punishing us or is not upset with us? Really tricky, guys. Very tricky. I feel like this issue right here is the issue that can either break you or make you. You can lose your relationship with Allah when you have calamity in life. It can be thrown out the window. People sometimes never recover. They feel broken, cheated, betrayed by Allah. And it doesn't work out again. And then there are those people then there are those people who use the pain and the sorrow, the loneliness of calamity to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Feeling betrayed is the easier route. I'm telling you, if you have kids who are teenagers, as teenagers, it's very common to, for you to feel that your parents betrayed you when you were young. It's very hard to see the silver lining and vice versa as well. For parents to think that their kids hate them, there was a father that I was sitting with recently and he was describing his son to me. And I kid you not, the language he used to describe his son could not be further from the reality. And I know this because I know the son, I know the father, I've known this family for a long time. This son only desires one thing, which is to please his father, but his father just can't see it. He, for some reason, everything his son and daughter do, he views it as what? They're trying to hurt him. Do you guys understand that? 
Now, sometimes they may put him through, they may not give him everything he wants. That's true. You know, but his father gets upset. His dad wants to go out for pizza. They say, no, his dad snaps. He thinks his son's being cheap. The son says, Imam, I'm not being cheap. What's the problem? Dude has cholesterol and diabetes, man. I can't take him out for pizza. That's that. He wants to go out for grilled chicken. You know, Vaifi, come, let's go. Let's go, have a, let's go have a blast together. So, you have to create perspective again on why you're going through what you're going through. Okay, so let's walk through a few scenarios. This may take a little while, okay? Hopefully we'll get to another question after this, but I'm not going to rush through this because it's a very real question and I want to spend a little time on it. Is there a possibility that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is punishing you through your difficulties in life? Is it possible that your child is doing drugs today because you didn't wear hijab yesterday? That's a common thing people say, by the way. Okay? Is it possible that your marriage is falling apart right now because you didn't do hijab in your life? Is it possible that your business went under because you took a riba-based loan when you started off the business? These are all possibilities. Are you guys following me? These are very rough statements to make. Because remember this. Whenever you attribute something to Allah, you better be... Can I say something really rough? Can I say a word, like, a word that's a little harsh? Okay, I'm going to say it. In the spirit of being from Texas and not caring. <laughs> if you're going to attribute something to Allah, no, I'm not going to say it. Come on. I'll say it in another way. How about this? If you're going to attribute something to Allah, you better be sure, very, very sure, instead of that, there's a word that starts with a D. Uh, you need to be very sure that that's what Allah said. Do you guys understand that? You better be sure that Allah said that. Don't, don't attribute something to Allah in thought, in action, in statement that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not say, did not do, did not intend. Are you guys following this? So that's why I carefully use the word possibly. Is it possible? And what's the answer to that? Of course it is. Of course it's possible. The Quran says it. وَمَا أَصَابَكُمْ مِن مُصِيبَةٍ فَبِمَا كَسَبَتْ أَيْدِيكُمْ وَيَعْفُوا now this verse is very important because in this verse we learn that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says many a calamities you face in your life are a result of your doings. Many calamities you face in your life are a result of your doings. That's like a simple translation. Now people they assume because of ver this verse and verses like it that every calamity we face is a result of our actions. Now that's problematic. The reason is because I want you to look at the verse and I'm going to read it one more time and I want you to see, for those of you who understand the Arabic language, for those of you who don't, sit this one out. For those of you who understand the Arabic language, I want you to focus on what the most important part, component of this verse is. وَمَا أَصَابَكُمْ مِن مُصِيبَةٍ فَبِمَا كَسَبَتْ أَيْدِيكُمْ وَيَعْفُوا عَنْ كَثِيرٍ What's the most important part, one of the most important parts of this verse? What did you say? What part there? Min, thank you so much. The most important part of that statement is what? Min. Now if you're wondering, what does that have to do with anything? What does the word min have to do with anything? In the Arabic language, the word min is for tab'id. What is it for guys? Tab'id. What that means, let me give you an example. What was your name again? Suhair. 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 Let's say for example, I say to Sister Suhair, I say to Sister Suhair, I want you to read Harry Potter. What does she need to do? Read everything that's called Harry Potter. Every book, every page, anything that this name Harry Potter applies to, what does she need to do? Come on guys, you have to engage. She needs to read it. Now if I said to her, read from Harry Potter, what would she say? Which part? Do you guys understand? Min is for? Tab'eed. Allah didn't say all calamity is a result of your actions. Allah says there are some calamities that you will face that are a result of your actions. Do you guys understand that? وَمَا أَصَابَكُمْ مِن مُصِيبَةٍ Some calamity. Now, if we're going to say some calamity is a result of our actions, now we have to define it. We have to define it. We can't just leave it open-ended, can we? Because that's going to leave people in paranoia. So in order to answer this issue, we turn to the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ like we always would, and the scholars, they actually do a phenomenal job at saying, there are very clear statements of the Prophet ﷺ telling us that there are certain actions, if you do them, you will face the, the punishment of that in the world. Do you guys understand that? So for example, the Prophet ﷺ said, 
when zina becomes common, you will find illness in the people. Do you guys understand that? So the Prophet himself is saying, this sin will lead to this repercussion. It's not, it's not open-ended. Otherwise, if you leave it open-ended, the problem is that people are going to live in paranoia. How will they ever have a healthy relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when they can never determine, determine the intent of Allah behind what they're experiencing, therefore being in a perpetual state of negativity to Allah? Can you have a relationship with Allah like that? You can't. The only way you can have a relationship with Allah is that if you, based on a prior precedent, establish that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not bloodthirsty to punish you, therefore, the default state is every calamity I face is a source of my growth for myself with the possibility that it may be a punishment. Ya Allah, forgive me if I did anything wrong. Okay, that's done. I was sincere and I asked Allah for forgiveness. Therefore, the remaining part of this isn't a punishment from Allah, rather it's for my personal development. Do you guys understand that? And I can continue and talk about this for a long time. But I'm going to actually close off with uh, answering this point with a statement of the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in surah wa duha At the end he says, وَأَمَّا بِنِعْمَةِ رَبِّكَ فَحَدِّثْ Be positive when it comes to your relationship with Allah. That's why I said you need to be very careful when you attribute anything to Allah. Rather than attributing Allah attributing punishment to Allah, anger to Allah, how about you do what Allah does for Himself, which is attributing mercy and compassion and love to Himself. Which vision, which version of Allah is more appealing to you? A version of Allah that's very similar in description to shaitan, that's very angry, frustrated, wants to, wants to hurt you, wants to misguide you, wants you to feel pain, or a description of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that is more suitable, more appropriate, and is actually his description of himself, Anta kama athnayta ala nafsik, which is that he is ar-Rahman, ar-Rahim, al-Afu, al-Ghafur, ar-Rahim. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is passionate, he's more loving to a human being than his mother can ever dream of loving him. That's a description of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So now you have to choose the paradigm. Is your paradigm based off of love for Allah? or based out of fear for, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that will truly impact the spiritual course that you will take and what kind of impact that path will have on you as you move forward to build a relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wallahu alam